Hello, my name is Jackie Kay and I'm Chancellor of the University of Salford and also the Scottish Macker or the National Poet of Scotland. For years I've been coming to Manchester Literature Festival and I really admire the whole festival. I admire its ethos, I admire the way that you support activists and political thinkers as well as writers, writers known and less well known. I admire the way that you support writers in translation. I admire your Manchester sermon. I think the events have a great buzz and energy to them and I've been at so many over the years. I've loved doing events myself, often with my dear friend Ali Smith, they've been fantastic events. I've also loved attending events like the Manchester Sermon, which have given me food for thought for, for a very, very long time. Well, it's upsetting to me that you're in danger now and I would really love anybody who supports you and literature, new writing and writers around the world to dig a wee bit into your pocket and pay the price of a drink or the price of a theatre ticket or anything that you could actually afford and go on the website www.manchesterliteraturefestival.co.uk. Cheers. Hello and welcome to the Manchester Literature Festival. I am so delighted to be here in conversation with Maza Mengeste. Uh, Maza is the author of two novels, Beneath the Lion's Gaze and The Shadow King, both of which are set in Ethiopia, which is the country of her birth, from which her family fled when she was four years old. They eventually settled in America, where Maza now lives and teaches. Beneath the Lion's Gaze was named one of The Guardian's 10 best contemporary African books, and The Shadow King was, just weeks ago, shortlisted for the Booker Prize. It's an extraordinary book about which the New York Times reviewer was quite understandably moved to say, this novel made me feel pity and fear, and more times than is reasonable, gave me goosebumps. Mazo, welcome and hello. Hi, Camila, it's so good to see you. So good even to see you, through even through the screen. Hi. <laughs> It, it's funny, it's, I mean, looking at you, it's hard not to remember the last time we met. Um, it, was, it was March 3rd, and we did an event together at the British Library. Yeah. And I can remember how close or far apart we sat, and I thought there was no reason then for us to notice. And then we went out, a bunch of us, for dinner afterwards to an Ethiopian restaurant in King Cross. And yeah. March 3rd. And so within a week, that became unthinkable. Within a week, I think almost we were in lockdown. That that might have been the last group dinner I was mm. a part of. Yeah, I think it was for me as well. Um, and of course, you live in New York, which has been particularly hard hit. And I know we're here to talk about the book, but it, it seems false not to mm. refer to the, the moment we're in. What's it been like in New York? I mean, it's been such a mad few months since then. It really has. You know, I, I was... I was in Zurich for most of the 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 worst of of New York City's pandemic. I was there on a fellowship. Flights were canceled. I I stayed there until I could fly back. I'm back here now and what I realize is that my experience of the pandemic living in Switzerland was so completely different hmm. from the the New Yorkers experience, those who stayed in the city that uh I came back and realized I did not have the levels of paranoia and fear that other people did. That is a starkly different experience, um, which I think is very telling about the what the state of the United States right now. Um, but where I am living in New York City is one of the nine hot zones where this virus is is doing a resurgence. So. As of right now, I think we're about to go into lockdown either today it's been announced or tomorrow for two weeks and possibly a month. So this thing is not over yet. Um, and I think that, you know, we're here to talk about the book and we're here to talk about writing, but 
you know, all of these come from an interior space. And right now we're living in, in play, no matter where we are, we're living in a world that is wrecking havoc on that space. You know, it's funny. I remember when I first went to America as a student and one of the my senses of it coming from Pakistan was, was that this was a country where you didn't have to feel history breathing down your neck. Um, right? And, and that is no longer true. Um, but but I want to talk to you about history, Maza, because I, I read somewhere you talking about the fact that when you were working on your first novel, which is set during the 1974 revolution in Ethiopia, you were very aware that because you left at such a young age, that most of the most of your knowledge of, of the revolution came down to the stories of your family, mm -hmm. these three lives. Um, but of course, that is what the novel that tells us history always has to do is to find these individual lives that will animate a much larger story. And I wonder if you could start by talking about history and your life. I mean, how has history intersected with your life and, and that of your families? Well, I think there is, you know, the history with the capital H, the revolution mm -hmm. that began in, in the early 70s, mid 70s, which was the reason that my family and I left Ethiopia. It's the reason that several family members of mine were, you know, were killed or, or disappeared. It's the reason that so many I know had to flee. Um, it created dramatic shifts in people's lives. Mm -hmm. And I think it, it changed the course of generations. And there's that history, that, that mm -hmm. revolution. And then there's also that other history, which is the personal lives, mm -hmm. the intimate stories, the memories that reflect those larger world events. Um, that felt to me, that was something that I could not get my family to talk about for a really long time. You know, as immigrants, I, I, or I feel like I'm not the only one who has found myself in a country and wondered, how did I get here? What happened to bring me here? Because if I could figure out what happened, it would also explain my place in this new world. Mm -hmm. And if my, you know, my family didn't want to talk about this, um, this was too traumatic of a history. It was much too soon. So I had to delve into my own memories mm -hmm. and into history that I could find in textbooks and see where the gaps were, but also where they merged. So I can be good. I could understand what I was witnessing as a child when mm -hmm. I was seeing certain things happen. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that that, uh, that immersion and also that realization that, that what happens in the world, what happens in a country is closely connected to what happens to my, what happened in my personal life, mm -hmm. um, fed my interest in history, in research, in finding mm -hmm. out all those stories beneath that, that capital H that seems to be um, mm -hmm. the only place that many people look. Mm. Were they happier to talk about an earlier history? So the period, the first novel, of course, is about that period when you were growing up. The second one, The Shadow King, is, is an earlier period in, in the 30s to early 40s. Did you have more, more stories about it from your family? Was that a time anyone was willing to talk about or was it just complete yeah. erasure? Well, that's that. You know, that's a really interesting question because those stories from 1935 came much more readily. Hmm. Um, but they were stories of heroics and they were stories of defiance. Here was an Ethiopian army, poorly equipped, had rifles, if they had rifles, you know, that were 50 years old. Hmm. Um, bullets had to be handmade. Every, and yet somehow this army of farmers, of people who were, you know, people who lived in villages, um, happened to defeat one of the most advanced militaries in the world at that time. Mm -hmm. That story fed my imagination. And it felt like because 1974 was so difficult to talk about, there was another moment that my parents and other Ethiopians could focus on mm -hmm. that became um, a comfort, a rallying cry, an assurance mm -hmm. that this is what defines us, not, not these years. Of, mm -hmm. of the revolution. So I, I had those stories, but 
of course, once I started thinking about writing a book on that moment, mm. I quickly realized that you can't have a war that lasted five years and all there are are just heroics and defiance. You know, mm. again, the personal stories, those things that nobody wants to talk about, the humiliations, mm. the, 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 love, the fear, that was not discussed. Right. And so that was also interesting to, to unpack. And also, I suppose there's an element of mythologizing as well that goes on that, that you know, this, it is such a myth to think that you can have a war with all the violence within it and there can be a side that is only heroic. Yeah. That, yeah. And it's, you know, but, and within, within those, th those myths, are necessary. I do think those myths are necessary. I I needed those stories when I came to the United States. I needed them when I was being confronted with racism and mm -hmm. anti-immigrant sentiment. Those stories propped me up and let me know exactly who I was. And in fact, I felt pity for these white Americans who had no history. They had mm -hmm. nothing. You know, I could trace my history back thousands of years and they had what, 200, 400, mm -hmm. you know, pity them. Yeah. Um, but so I needed that and I understand the value in that. But again, it's it's the stories of the victors that the victory that gets told. But within that, I started finding much more complicated realities um, of people who have to question what freedom means. Who are we fighting for? Mm -hmm. Who are we fighting against? If we're being subjugated um, by by leadership that that treats us a certain way because we're really poor, and these Italians are saying, "Hey, you know, we'll give you freedom. Mm -hmm. You will have security with us. Why wouldn't they yeah. fight for that?" So there are all these interesting questions beneath that. And of course, one of the things. Um one of the myths around your novel, which is not a myth, but a fact, but but feels mythic, is that you had an 800 page draft. <laughs> and then you threw it, I mean, literally just put it to a side, didn't even sort of go back and say, I need to revise this. You put the 800 pages entirely to one side and started anew. That was madness. Now I know. Uh, you know, <laughs> we've got what we've got, but 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 why 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 did that happen? Yeah. It what I had written was really bad, okay. Camilo. When I say it was really bad, it was I know you know as writers, I feel like we know that feeling when we're 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 moving at full speed into a scene and through chapters and we know it's not good and we keep waiting for something to change and i would keep waiting from chapter to chapter nothing changed it just was bad mm -hmm. um and what i mean by that was that i had done so much research on this novel that i could i had written the historical events but i hadn't dug into who it's happening to why does it matter right yeah, i was putting my my characters through their paces, but mm -hmm. not really developing what war is, which is a confrontation of, you know, personal ideals and relationships and all the intimacies that human human beings might value get disrupted. Mm -hmm. And I had not found the story within that historical backdrop. Mm -hmm. And there was really nothing to salvage. I, I just had to count on the fact that everything I needed was up here mm -hmm. over all the years. And it was now time to learn these characters um and Did so i the second version was it faster because there was so much already inside you in terms of being in terms of getting it out some of it was much faster mm -hmm. uh it was much faster but then what i what i realized is that um i hadn't i hadn't rendered italian characters well i mm -hmm. had I didn't know how to approach them. And once I slowed down in that second draft and said, I've got to learn these people, that mm -hmm. took a little bit of time. And that, to, to deal with them, the, mm -hmm. you know, to deal with Italians that are racist, misogynistic, that are aggressive, that have, they have their flaws, but I wanted to make them human also. Mm -hmm. um, dealing with that and dealing with Kidane mm -hmm. uh, and his assaults on Hirut, and on Aster and making him 
a more complicated figure mm -hmm. took more time than I thought. There were certain moments where I didn't, I did not think that scenes would come out well. Mm. Yeah. Um, I, I want you to talk about, actually I'd love you to talk about all your characters, but since we don't have time for that, these two central women, women, Hirut and Asta, you have in the end note of your novel, you've, you've written, the story of war has always been a masculine story. But this was not true for Ethiopia and has never been that way in any form of struggle. Women have been there. We are here now. Um, can you talk to us about Hirut and Aster in the context of that, that note you, you've written? Yes, um, two things. The mm -hmm. one thing I started understanding when I was looking at this war, looking at 1935 and Mussolini's invasion of Ethiopia as really um, historians were calling it the first real war of World War II. Mm -hmm. And then I started thinking about the way that we mark history around the world. And it's mm -hmm. often by conflicts, World War I, World War II, you know, World War II, we have Korean War, we have the Vietnam War, we have all of these conflicts mm -hmm. that, that are markers of, mm -hmm memory right. and those so what it means is that we remember things through aggression mm -hmm. and if we count aggression as male as masculine war will make a man out of you what we're really talking about is a masculine way to read the world and the women who are actually working to continue support extend mm -hmm. communities support mm -hmm. societies, um, they are not being counted in that history because history is marked mm -hmm. by confrontations. Mm -hmm. And I wondered what would happen if Hirut and Aster, you know, Aster especially as the wife of a noble woman, as, as a wife of a nobleman mm -hmm. says, I am one to fight for my country too. Isn't mm -hmm. it my country? and decides to start galvanizing and training women to join men in the front lines. Hirut kind of gets dragged along, but eventually she says, wait, this could be my opportunity to change my world. War could, since it's disrupted so much for her, for Aster, um, it could actually be a moment of change uh, for, her, for her future. Um, so these two women decide to take part in the war. They decide that they will fight in the front lines. They will galvanize other women. And I wondered what, what does that, how does this reconfigure our understanding of aggression? Mm -hmm. If women can also be aggressive, how does it force us to redefine what manhood is if suddenly it's not war that makes a man out of you because women are also there? And what does it mean for a man who thinks in terms of masculinity, but he's fighting right next to a woman or is getting shot at by a woman or is shooting a woman? Um, there, one of the scenes that was part of that 800 page book, or maybe it was in the final other draft and I took it out. I had a scene between the Italians, Ettore and some of the other Italians pointing their guns shooting people and then they suddenly realize that it's women that they're shooting at mm -hmm. and i wondered what an italian would think because italian we we have this sense that italians you know machismo is, is it, it, it it's very much a part of that society the patriarchy the respect for their mothers you know all these things seem um a part of italian society and i wonder what it would look like if they suddenly realized they were shooting at women and would they see them as women or would they see them as soldiers? Um, it was the, the, that scene, as well as many other scenes, not quite fit in the final draft, but it's a question I've had. Like, how does it upend everything if women start fighting? And we know that women have fought in wars. We know that they've been part of liberation movements and anti-colonial movements around the world, um, but they're not written about. And I think that that's, um, that's a consequence of who gets to tell the story. Yeah. Do we know much about women in that 1935 to 41 period in Ethiopia? Well, I will tell you this, Camila. I thought that when I found a, a headline here, a small article there, mm -hmm. some you know references, I thought that I 
I was lucky. If I found one, that means that there were maybe five. If I could find five, then definitely there might have been 10, 20 for a novelist, 50 might be great. But I was talking to a historian um, who recently published a book on Ethiopian warfare, and she told me, oh, no, there were thousands hmm. in the armies. And this was after you'd written all these characters that you found? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. I mean, this is, this is what happens, right, when you're researching. We've talked about research in your novels. You do something, then later when it's done, you find out all of this other information. But, yeah, I found that out after the book was published. Well, I suppose it's one of those things that you can do with history as a novelist is that you can say there's this little glimmer here, but this little glimmer suggests a much larger light beyond. Absolutely. And that's the strength of fiction. Mm. to begin to apply logical questions to mm -hmm. those erasures on those voids that we find. If this, then this. Yeah. Um, and I think that's what, that is what we, um, that's what makes fiction in many ways sometimes truer than history. Mm -hmm. I bet historians are going to get upset by that, but well, it's true. I, mean, I once had a historian when I was researching a novel saying, you know, could this have happened? And she said, as a historian who studied this, I'm sure it's happened, but I don't have the hard factual evidence. You go and write it. That's, you know? that's our strength. Yeah. That is our strength. Yes. But I'm interested with the question of, of bringing women's stories into warfare and what that does to, to the machismo and, and the masculine story. And I'm interested particularly in how you approach the question of rendering violence on the page. I, I read an interview with that one of your former students was interviewing you and he said that actually in one of your craft workshops when you're teaching, you make them discuss the question of violence, um, which I think is such a crucial thing for, for writers to think about. And, and what, what do you tell your students about, mm. about violence on the page? You know, I, I often, I tell them this story that, that, uh, that it's a, an event that happened to me when I was researching my first novel about the revolution. And I was at the moment try, uh, talking to uh, people who had been revolutionaries in Ethiopia. I was talking to a woman who had been imprisoned and had gone through interrogation and, and torture in prison. And she said to me, um, you know, Maaza, there was a time there was at, at some point when she was brought back from from an interrogation session and it, it had been particularly bad she said i she said i couldn't move she couldn't move in the cell she said but then i stood up and i walked to my mother's house mm -hmm. and then i turned the corner and i went to my best friend's house mm -hmm. And then I went and visited the garden that I, you know, and she was telling me these places she went. And what I realized is she was, the, her mind had created these pockets mm -hmm. of refuge mm -hmm. and that our brain is wired that way. We are given the capacity for mercy mm -hmm. in the way that we are built. And I mm -hmm. have often wondered about ways that language can also offer us those mercies, especially mm -hmm. in in those moments where it feels unbearable, you know, mm -hmm. when we're witnessing moments or writing moments that are unbearable. Mm -hmm. And so with, with these scenes of violence, um, out of respect to the people who have mm -hmm. suffered, but also to test language, I mean, structurally as a writer, how much weight can I put on a sentence, put on a paragraph in a moment mm -hmm. to both let you know exactly what's happening, but mm -hmm. also to give you a sense that these characters are built um, with mercies in them, that we all are, and can language reflect that, if that makes sense, that um, I wanted language to take the weight, but to offer the reader and offer the character something else as well. You know, one of the moments that, that I think is the most striking in the novel, and there are many, is when you have, and it's not really spoiler alert, <laughs> but you have, you have the Ethiopians being being flung off a cliff, mm. and someone for an Italian photographing them while that happens. I, I wonder how you. I mean, that must have been a difficult thing to write, and I wondered how you approached that and thought around this question of 
what can language do to tell this very large moment, this enormous thing? Wow. Yeah. You know, um, I went to one of those sites. Hmm. It was one of the last research trips that I took before I was um, submitting the book, the final edits. And I stood in a crevice between two boulders and I looked down and it's, it's, it is absolutely dizzying, you know, but if you don't look down and you look this way straight ahead, it's breathtaking. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought at that point, how do I, how do I reflect this thing that is both horrifying and breathtaking? The audacity of trying to, th of throwing human beings off a cliff, which the Italians did do, yeah. Um, and I remember the shock of when I first heard that, but I thought of, I thought of Icarus, you know, I thought mm -hmm. of these, these stories, these myths that the way that myth is sometimes a, a pocket to hide in or mm -hmm. a, a refuge to step into, to help explain something that is often too horrifying for the imagination to grasp immediately. And once I started thinking of the myth, um, it felt a little bit easier for me to at least wrap my own mind and my own imagination around it in order to render it. Otherwise, it's way too horrifying. Yeah, I mean, the Greek myths do come up in all kinds of ways in, in this novel, including the fact that there is an actual chorus that, that speaks. Yeah. Um, what, what, do, what do those Greek myths, can you talk about the Greek myths and, and this novel and, and how they perhaps gave you a way to start thinking through the very complex and various structure of the novel. Yeah, you know, I was, I was thinking about this, the Greek myths were, you know, you, I'm re, I was, you know, reading Agamemnon, reading mm -hmm. Medea, reading any of these, um, these, the chorus steps in. I was especially struck with the chorus in Agamemnon. Mm -hmm. uh, they, when the book, when the story there, the play opens and Agamemnon's on his way home and Clytemnestra has been ruling that household with an iron fist for 10 years, you know, the chorus is just tired. They're just a bunch of old men and, and they basically say, we don't like her, but we're done. Like we can't wait for Agamemnon to come in. And I thought about their attitude throughout mm -hmm. this. They're not that heroic chorus, the figure, you know, maybe an opera. Um, that I I had all often imagined they had a personality. Yeah. They would sometimes talk to, back and forth to each other. Mm -hmm. And I thought about that and it reminded me of um, the Ethiopian tradition, uh, the, the griots, the troubadours called the Asmari, who carry history in a village, in a town, who sing things out, who relay news, relay gossip. Um, through music in tiny bars that people would come and visit, or I'm, you know, in the 30s and earlier, I'm sure they were walking around as well. And I think they were keepers of history. When society was disrupted by conflict and war, they could look out and repeat what happened through their music. And when I think about Homer's chorus, think about the chorus that's been used in in Greek tragedies. It makes sense to me because Ethiopia is an ancient culture would, of course, share some mm -hmm. of the same things that would have that happened in Greece mm -hmm. in, in, the, in, the, you know, in the ancient times millennia ago. Of course, they would both have that. This is not a Greek phenomenon. This is an African phenomenon, an Asian phenomenon. We've had this. So mm -hmm. I wanted to incorporate that because it was an Ethiopian re reality. But as a novelist, um, structurally, it made this book really fun because look, I wanted the course to have an attitude. And when I was trying to figure out what kind of personality they would have, there was a line that came to me. It said, oh, they're pissed. Mm. They're a group of women and they are pissed. Mm. So I thought this is going to be fun. And mm. I wanted to incorporate them into the story. They speak mm. back to history. Yeah. There, there's one character I, I want to ask you about which is Haile Selassie himself. Hmm. 
speaking of myth and rendering myth, he appears in both your novels. And, and I, I, what is it like to, to take a character who was a real person in history, but is also profoundly mythologized and make him a character, which you do in sort of two different stages of his life over the course of two novels? Yeah, you know, if the if ghosts do exist, Camilla, I think at some point he would just like to like slap me and like, would you stop this, please, leave me alone. Yeah. Um, but I, 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 I don't, I don't find him as a human being fascinating. I mean, mm -hmm. he was brutal, he was complicated, he was benevolent on one hand and absolutely brutal on the other. I don't mm -hmm. find him. He's not a rivet. That part is. It's okay, but what I was really interested in is what he symbolized. Mm -hmm. You know, he's, he symbolizes this freedom, uh, you know, that Ethiopia's fight against colonialism, and yet he wasn't in the country for most of that battle, for most of that Bar. war. Pardon? Bar. He was in Bath, Jane yeah. Austen. Yeah, he was, you know, he was in Bath in this huge house. Mm -hmm. uh, and I said, wow, well, okay, I want to deal with that conundrum yeah. of this man. Um, but, you know, I really was not going to work with him in this novel because I wanted the novel to focus on women and girls. Mm -hmm. I wanted to deal with what happens in the intimate spaces yeah. uh, between men and women and then how that translates into war. But I discovered um, in my research of this history that Haile Selassie had a daughter who was 14 years old and he had married her off in 1932 um, to a man who was almost 50. Hmm. That man eventually became a collaborator with, with Italy during the war. Uh, but Haile Selassie married his daughter off um, in order to keep peace between these two families, in order to maintain his power, in order to basically control them. He sent this girl over. She was sending uh, messages home saying, they're not treating me well. They're not treating me well. Please come get me. He left her there and she died mm -hmm. under mysterious circumstances. And she was all but erased from history. I found one photograph of her and I have not found any, men he, any mention. Just she's not mm -hmm. talked about it. He didn't talk about her. Um, and I said, I in a story about women and the way that the girls and women are used both as territory to be conquered and trophies mm -hmm. to be won and exchanged, um, this is something I can't ignore. So he ended up coming in there. Mm. You said there's only one photograph of her and photographs have been really important to you in the, I mean, they're, they're there in the book because we have, it's already this, Italian man who is who you don't allow to become a monster even while he's doing monstrous things. I mean, he, he's a really fascinating character in there. Um, and of course, he's taking some photographs that should never have been taken, really. Um, but I know that the photographs were, were important to you. And I wonder if you could talk us through, maybe even show us if possible, some of the photographs that fed into this novel. Absolutely. I, you know, um... We can start with this one mm -hmm. right here, which is something that I've had for, I don't know how long since I first started thinking about writing a book set in 1935. And without knowing it, I was starting to collect photographs that Italians took when mm -hmm. they were in Ethiopia, in Eritrea, in Somalia. That archive was growing as I was writing my first book without me even really understanding what I was doing. Uh, when when the Italians were taking photographs, was it a kind of accidental and wandering around? I've got a camera, or was it sort of part of an imperial project? I well, two things. There, it was part of an imperial project. Like the photographs that Ettore is taking uh, with Fucelli are really part of that that fascist drive to maintain a narrative of co colonized or co you know people as uh, dependent as primitive as savage you know so the photographs that he was taking in the book were both to affirm italian power mm -hmm. and confirm something about the african that made them worthy of oppression mm -hmm. uh, 
But then I became very interested in the, in the photographs that Italians were taking in their personal lives. Mm -hmm. the one, the, you know, those people that would take their cameras to war and were snapping things that were casual in their free time, in their barracks, mm -hmm. out at bars. You know, I would, became very interested in that. Um, and those told a story about, um, I think, the complexity of war that I found very fascinating. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to continue to study those because, you know, Ettore takes photographs of atrocities, but he's also taking other things. Like he's, he's photographing Hirut and Aster in prison in, a, in moments of silence and quiet. Um, and I was curious about those things where there's no apparent violence, but you understand that the, the, the framing of this is all violent. Mm -hmm. um, and so those, those photographs have often, have always to me been fascinating and complicated. And I wanted to include some of them in the book, but you know, I have some of them as well here. Hmm. Um, you do have the, the book itself has two photographs, right? Yes, and I I have um, there's one in the book, mm -hmm. but I have I don't know if we can see this. Yeah, we can see that. So yeah. this is one of them that's in the book, and uh, these are postcards. I think uh, that's available through my publisher in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, I have this these photographs. I mean, they were they were surrounding me but what I did and I don't know if you can see it but I um, I have some I took some down hmm. oh yeah and, and you know like yeah. when um, when I was thinking of of the cook in mm -hmm. in younger years this was one of the first I just brought this down and I was staring at her hmm. um, writing this story and I have, um, you know, when I'm thinking about Kidani, mm -hmm. right. you know, and the mm -hmm. thing that he wore, that, that mm -hmm. this cape. It's this is one of the first pictures. Um, when I think of a Klilu, I, mm -hmm. you know, a sniper. Yeah. A Klilu in the book is a sniper, and it's inspired mm -hmm. by by this, you know. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is that. Okay, so these are dramatic pictures, and these are wonderful. And the, but the next question for me is, who took these? In what situation? Who took the photograph of the sniper, and how could he survive? If that was an Italian. You know, what are the dynamics here? I mean, the, with this photograph, it's it's actually a, a it was a British photojournalist that that took it. But I'm always asking this: who took it, and how did they manage to take this? Mm -hmm. And so, when I see, for example, the 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 man, the chieftain with this headdress, and I know that an Italian took it, the one thing I understand is this is not a, a photograph about the man that's photographed. It's a photograph that is speaking to Italian power, because an Italian could stand in front of this man and still survive. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the reasons I wanted to incorporate photographs in the book or the, the word images so mm -hmm. I could speak through some of this because what's visible in a photograph is often um, only the surface level mm -hmm. and I wanted to dig into the rest. You know, there's this phrase that that gets used a lot around particularly photojournalists or, or anyone who is in some way bringing back news or images of violence and conflict and all kinds of things and which is bearing witness yeah i um, feel like you and i had a discussion about this at you did, and I, had been about it. I wondered if you could go back to that 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 phrase and you know which is always thrown out as as though it is a phrase saying something wonderful you are bearing witness well done yeah and i i've been you know and i've thought about our conversation ever since we had it in in london that night um i i have found that that phrase to become more and more complicated and, and problematic for me because this idea of bearing witness um, glorifies the person who is doing the witnessing as if the act of witnessing is a burden to be borne. And that in that process of bearing witness, um, it's saying something about that person's virtue. 
it's mm -hmm. uh, it's it, it's I guess it's implying a a, a dignity that mm -hmm. I think needs to be conferred on the people who are subject subjected to the violence. Mm -hmm. um, they are the ones that are really bearing the burden of that experience. It's not the witness. Mm -hmm. The witness tells the story, but that telling should not be a burden. Mm -hmm. It's not something to be born. Um, it's, and so the power dynamics, even in that bearing witness phrase, mm -hmm. feels to me skewed. And it's yeah. skewed in the way that a, photo a camera in the hand of one person is always or often going to skew the power dynamics when mm -hmm. two people are present. Yeah. Tell me about Project 3541. Since we're on. Uh, thank you for asking. Project 3541.com mm -hmm. is an online archive of photographs from the 1935 to 41 Italo-Ethiopian War. Mm -hmm. I am uploading, posting my own photographs from, from that my personal collection of that period. But I'm asking people, Italian, um, Ethiopian, Eritrean, Somali, um, anyone who is involved in this, mm -hmm. if you have family history connected to this, you can get on that site. And there are ways that you could contact me or some of the people who are helping me with this. Um, there's a way to upload images. There are instructions on there. It's an effort to reclaim this history by, by retelling our personal stories connected to that moment. Mm -hmm. Thank you for asking. No, that's wonderful. I'm going to ask you to um, finish us off with, with a reading, Maza, because we've been telling you for the richness of everything that we have to But okay. before we do that, I want, I want to ask you to tell a story because, you know, as you said, there's so much that is grim going on in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the, the moments, you know, where I, I cheered recently was when you were, were shortlisted for the book. Can you just tell us how you found out? <laughs> tell us about that moment. Oh, my gosh. Um, I, I was, I got the call mm -hmm. uh, and when my editor told me the news, I think we were both just burst out screaming. And I was like, oh my God, oh my God. I'm sure I said, oh shit. It's like, oh my God, oh my God. And then when, you know, when we hung up, I just sat and got, I was just shaking and I got really quiet and I stayed quiet for a long time. I just could not speak. The, the, it was, I mean, we use the word stunning, I use it loosely sometimes. It was stunning news. It had stunned me into silence. Um, I was overjoyed, but really overcome. You know, then the tears came. Mm -hmm. But um, it was wonderful. In a in a year of of bad news, terrifying news, to get this uh, was is, is an immense gift. Yeah. Well, it is stunning news, and it's a stunning book. And thank you. Please read for us from. Okay. I am. I will read from uh, this moment with Aster mm -hmm. when she is calling the women to battle um, or, yeah, galvanizing them. Aster is a glorious figure astride her horse, Bunna. She has loosened her braids and thick strands of hair fall against her neck and spread like a dark curtain around her sunlit face. She snaps the animal to a trot across the crest of the hill, her cape fanning across her figure, the golden clasp trapping flints of afternoon light. Mm -hmm. Women, she shouts, sisters, are you listening to me? Her voice rises into the sky, a blade slicing through the valley below, startling the women from their tasks, forcing them to lift their heads and turn in her direction. Sisters, are you ready for what's to come? Ethiopia's gifted Asmari will sing of this day for years, of how the women drop their baskets and their jugs, how they push away their looms and piles of wool. They rise to their feet nearly in unison, unaware of their own glory, and lift their faces toward us, their voice. That they pause long enough to listen to the top, soft tap of distant gunfire, is a detail that the songs will repeat again and again. The musicians will make of the women's frowns a forewarning of what's to come. 
The singers will use the women's gasps and exclamations as signs of their growing strength. One Asmari after the next will sing these words as they play their masinko. That first battle cry was already forming in the women's throats. As their knew she just needed a way to usher it out. The women were ready but did not know it. There were bullets to be made and gunpowder to mix and rifles to load and enemies to shoot. Women, those who can make bullets, come to me. Aster's voice carries across the valley before breaking into echoes and scattering into the horizon. She is one woman. She is many women. She is all the sound that exists in the world. That's beautiful. Thank you so much. I, I can't actually resist asking another question, which is just about the language of it, because one of the, the remarkable things in this is how you give us a language that is both heightened to match the, the the occasion, but also intimate. Oh. And I wonder whether, again, was that something that was there at all in that first draft, or you know, did it come quite naturally, or did you really have to go searching oh. for it? That's a really good question, Camila. Um, it was not there in the first draft. Mm. That first draft was really straightforward. It was written in, in past tense. There was no chorus there was nothing there were no photographs it was a linear quite a dry retelling of historical research um but once i threw away that blank that manuscript and started again on a blank page i gave myself full freedom to write the way i wanted i wanted the writing to reflect the sweep of moments and also the I, I don't know the the moments when when it it could be light and move up. You know, mm -hmm. I didn't want heavy words. I wanted words that I don't know if that makes sense, but um, I, I wanted to give myself that freedom. I thought of language as water that you go through, mm -hmm. and that water has to be flexible, but it could sometimes have a weight to it. Mm -hmm. And um, once I told myself I could do anything I wanted, and I could write the way I heard this. Um, this is what seemed to come out. Hmm. Well, it comes out beautifully. And it, it's such a pleasure to read and to reread. Um, and for those of you who are, who are watching in, you can already tell from this conversation that, you know, that this is a book of such intelligence and integrity, and, but also a really, really good story. I mean, these are characters who you, whose lives you really get caught up in and you feel in such complicated ways about them. Um, you know, there's not, there's no sort of straightforward black and white in here. Um, it's just a remarkable, remarkable work. And um, I'm so glad that a lot more people are going to come to it because of this shortlisting, which of course brings such, brings brings readers more than anything else. Um, and for those who don't have it yet, uh, if you go to the Manchester Literature Festival website, um, there's a link on the page that will take you to the festival booksellers where you can get it. You can also see what other events are coming up. Um, and I'm, I'm going to put in a personal plea here. The Manchester Literature Festival is one I really love. I'm a patron of it. Um, and we all know these are difficult times. Um, the festival is above all committed to getting things out to those of you who can. Um, they know that the times are tough, so they're not going to ask you to give money if you can't. But if you can, if you can, you know, give a price of a cup of coffee or one of those meals you aren't having out right now because indoor seems safer, uh, please do do donate to MLF to, to help them keep going. Um, but to end with Marcel, just simply thank you. Thank you, thank you both. so thank much, Carmela. Thank you. Wonderful to see you again. You too. Goodbye, festival audience. Wish we could see you. I know. <laughs> Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye.